since I had photographs of that same shanty town. The only thing that's changed since 1967 <laughs> now have TV uh, uh, satellite. Okay. Uh, half of my thesis, my thesis is called The Rock and Power Structure as Seen from Below Political Participation in a Castle Like a Shanty Town. And basically, it, half of it, which is why it's so well read, is just simple translations from uh, Arabic and French into the English, the voices of a uh, half dozen Moroccans who live in the shanty towns, which from a distance appears to be the dregs of society, but very, very complex. Uh, and in living a year and working and seeing the world from that perspective, several things sort of jumped out at me. One, and this really has to do with, I think, the spirit of this evening. First of all, the need for cultural diplomacy. Uh, we have neglected this. This society is paying a horrible price. Cultural, culture is an attempt to explain some of the larger phenomena of life. And you learn culture through language. Language is a window on thinking and feeling. And we prepare people who are expert, but who are totally incompetent in terms of cultural diplomacy. If you want to understand a society that's undergoing fundamental change, learn the language and hang out with the poets. And that begins right here in your own country. So you can snip it if off. That you'd be smart. You began to listen carefully to how they construct reality. And the answers are the language they use and how they use it. Now, I'm not just simply saying then denigration of women or whatever, but listen to it carefully. And there's an arrogance that we have to say, I don't want, I, I dismiss that. But you dismiss it at your own peril. The second thing is the, the absence of social imagination. If I were to pull the, the files of the people who were the official diplomats and official power brokers. If I pulled their files and saw where they went to school, what grades they got, what languages they learned, where did they travel, what other experiences have they had which would enrich their imagination so that they could project themselves in the shoes of the other, where they would have the capacity to say hello to the stranger with warmth and grace to say goodbye to that is how one ought to select. That's not in the process by which we either educate you as an undergraduate at the University of Maryland or select you and promote you. I think it's precisely those qualities that will slowly but surely allow us to bridge the gap between those people who are in Annapolis and the joke of Annapolis. <laughs> Arabic, I'm the police. To bridge the gap between that and the people in the shanty town <clears throat> who represent the growing majority of humankind. Now, I would just stop with two things. One, and I don't mean to uh, look at it. Instrumental rationality is a gift of the West. It's Western thought. It allows us to identify tasks. It allows us to think of people as instruments to achieve a larger purpose. And in and of itself, that's a wonderful pattern of human encounter. Of course, the question is, questions are in the service of what, in the service of whom. When you have a bureaucracy that goes crazy, and everybody in Kafka is happy, mm -hmm. you know, that's instrumental rationality that, that serves a good purpose. Unfortunately, we think that instrumental rationality is a preferred way of thinking. And look at our language. We talk about building, construction, uh, when in fact, and we talk about delivery, peace, delivery systems, mechanisms. You don't deliver peace, you deliver pizza. <laughs> You co-produce peace through consultation. That's how you build the relationships that allows you eventually to arrive at a condition which is less threatened. So getting away from the, the arrogance that there's only one dominant pattern of human encounter, which I call instrumental rationale, there are many others. And the last thing really is how to
to attract and retain people in official positions. Because I don't think it's the organizational arrangements, the mechanisms, the protocol that constrict us, but rather it's the imagination, the courage, and the conviction of people who have to play roles. If Henry Kissinger could decide that North Africa will be part of the Middle East, somebody else can decide it's part of Africa, even though we've got 30 years of protocol and, and whatever. So the point is to engage people, officially and unofficially, to look for new combinations of relationships and to encourage that. Now that calls for courage. It also calls for being clear about what's important. And in essence, it, it begins with the understanding that true happiness, true honor, lies in self-respect, dignity, high resolves, and noble purposes. I'm not sure if we'll this for somebody else. Well, imagination here is with capital I, meaning insight, rather than yes. imagination. It's of course in Arabic has the word for zero, which means to look and penetrate into the light of things, the reality of things. And, I, and it, it's all rational. We become so rational that we are not irrational. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the mind and the internet has a space. It should be a balance between the spirit, the mind, and the, and the soul. And I think this balance, somehow, we have lost it. If I may, because I won't sleep tonight if I can share it all. <laughs> I wrote this note on W.H. Orwell. It was, he started being an atheist, he became a communist, he was so angry, uh, he most probably would, told, would have told us tonight, shut up talking in the best suits had in town, lecturing on navigation on the ship of the <laughs> But uh, W.H. Auden, arriving on the scene during Europe's darkest hour, woke up to the fact that the healing of the schism in the soul, and this is Toynbee's phrase, defied <coughs> all the prescriptions of humanism, individualism, I like these titles, individualism, capitalism, liberalism, Marxism, existentialism, surrealism, humanism, agnosticism and social democracy. He bitterly criticized the English intellectuals who were horrified, and very rational intellectuals, who were horrified by Hitler and, and, and said, the English intellectuals who now cry to heaven against the evil incarnated in Hitler have no heaven to cry to, they have already disposed of. For him, liberalism and humanism seemed to have a fatal flaw in them, as this statement of his 1940 suggests, the whole trend of liberal form Europe has been to undermine faith in the absolute. It has tried to make re reason the judge, but since life is a changing process, the attempt to find a humanistic basis for keeping the promise works logically with the conclusion, I can break it whenever I feel it is convenient. It was essential, therefore, to renew that faith in the absolute which, according to him, seemed to be the only possible ground for moral judgments. Orton was in search of the vision that objectifies, and he wrote, either we serve the unconditional or some Hitlerian monster will supply an iron convention to do evil by. Okay. <laughs> Our time is very short. I'm going to take uh, the uh, the Irish is to try to extend a little bit longer. We have some very interesting questions. I'd like to ask the three of you to have any comments you would like to make before we go to the question. It's a hard act to follow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the ship is going back. Yeah. Okay, moving we'll along. Right uh, the first one I'd like to ask is, which is so puzzling. Does the concept of national sovereignty in this day help or hinder our I, I think it helps. I think we have tended as a superpower to be more sovereignty of other countries. The recognition of that sovereignty 